Well, as you can see, uh, the Barbie mania has not escaped the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. I was going to wear pink, but then I thought people would confuse me with Ken. And so I decided to not do that. Thank you, everyone uh, who helps make our services wonderful. Uh, everyone from our greeters, our Sabbath school teachers, our uh, technical people in the back, and of course, all of our worship leaders up front. Um, it's a great family to be a part of. Let's pray. God, as we pause this moment and we just take time to reflect upon your word and your plan for our lives, we open our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you would speak to us. We ask that this would be a special time of listening to your spirit and feeling your touch. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I've been doing just uh, an abbreviated series of a, of a kind, examining uh, a unique way of looking at the person of Jesus Christ through the first few chapters of the Gospel of John. Um, with camp meeting coming up uh, next week, obviously the program will be slightly different. We'll get back to our, our regular services toward the end of June. But uh, I'm going to be uh, going back to the Gospel of John this morning and, and sharing some thoughts from John chapter 4. Now, knowing that this is a, uh, a, a change of pace as far as the campus here is a little bit quieter with school being out and people already uh, out and about a little bit, knowing that children's church, I, I didn't go with uh, calling it a kid's quiz uh, nor a teen trivia, just wasn't sure uh, who would be available, but I still like to have this interactive moment in my sermons. I've done it for my entire ministry, so I still included it. I'm just calling it a quiz, though, and this, so this is going to be actually one of the few times that it's just going to be kind of open to all, all right, uh, open to all, and we will enjoy uh, just a time of reflection on these questions as we get into the story here in the Gospel of John. We've looked at uh, John a little bit, and I've tried to express what makes the Bible or that book uh, and that gospel unique among uh, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, one of the, the factors that has uh, been pointed out is that John is not as, as adept or not as um, obsessed, you might say, with pointing out as Jesus the miracle worker. He's actually very limited in identifying the miracles of Jesus. He, he's very selective. As the other gospels, it seems like every chapter and every verse, it's he's doing miracles, doing miracles. He's healing, he's raising the dead, he's doing uh, uh, feeding multitudes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. John is not like that. And traditionally, now there's debate about what a miracle is, which sounds like a funny thing. Um, like when Jesus reads someone's mind, well, that's a miracle. But because the Bible says it, that's not always given as a sign because it's not always obvious that He's doing it. So, traditionally, it is said that there are seven miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John, just seven. And I just wanted to refresh our memory on what those seven miracles are. So, I still want, for the sake of uh, uh, being able to hear and for our services that are streamed and recorded, I would still like to have uh, the microphones go around. So, um, I, John and George, this is why we make you guys elders. This is your spiritual gift right now. This is awesome. Oh, the yellow one is uh, no good. So, uh, we need pink. Apparently, we don't have pink. That's the problem right there. Um, so, how many of you remember the first miracle we talked about, actually, in John chapter 2, the turning of something into something? Do you remember what that was? Turning the… Oh, Eva, Yes. Oh, is the black one working? The into one. I can't hear you, Eva. Okay. Is the black one not working? Oh. <laughs> how about, how about, well, I, I have a mic, so I can't tell. I'm going to try this one. <laughs> the water into wine. Now, did you hear her? That was the one we want. Let's, let's forget the black one. Okay, so that was the first one. John calls it the first of Jesus' signs, um, and he uh, includes it in his, uh, in his gospel of Jesus. The second miracle is healing the nobleman's thumb. 
his wife. Oh, Day, is that you helping us out? Son. Yes, did you hear? It was his son. And that's actually the passage we're going to look at. That's the second of the miracles. Then he heals a paralytic or a paralyzed man at the pool of Scottsdale, right? The pool of Bethesda. The pool of Bethesda, that's right. I got the, Gene and I both got to go there last year and see the pool of Bethesda, so that was cool. Uh, then there was the feeding of the children, right? The feeding of the academy teenagers. The feeding of what? All right, Ken. 5,000. It is the 5,000. The only miracle of Jesus recorded with specificity in all four Gospels is the feeding of the 5,000. This is the only miracle that you will find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, so, very interesting that all four saw that one as significant enough to include it in their brief record of the life of Jesus. Then Jesus did something on the water. What did He do on the water? Did He water ski? Uh, he ice skated water. What did He do on the water? He f went fishing. He caught a nice marlin. Come on, church. Do we have some? Oh, Eva. <laughs> he walked on water. He walked on water. I have an idea. Why don't you guys? No, there's more. There's more. There's seven. That's just the first five. All right, there's two more. All right. He healed the man who was born... Canadian, right? Is that what it is? Is he healed the Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Line. just kidding. <laughs> Line. Healing the man who was born blind. Yes. I'm sorry, Patsy. All of a sudden, my mind went blank. That is correct. Canadians don't need healed. Canadians are beautiful, wonderful. I'm just kidding. All right. He raised someone from the dead. Who did he raise from the dead? This is someone we know their name. Who did he raise from the dead? Boy, it's a good thing we have these Lazarus. people. Lazarus. It was Lazarus. Is that what you were going to say, Vince? Yeah, good. All right, that was that was the end of it, guys. Thank you so very much. So these are the seven. John chooses seven. You think of the three and a half year ministry of Christ. And all of the wonders and miracles that Jesus did, John chooses these seven. But he does say at the end of his gospel, and there were also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. So John says, look, I'm not telling you everything. I know that there's a lot more. I am telling you some very specific things inspired by the Holy Spirit that I think are very uh, helpful in understanding who this Jesus person was. And I want to share with you just these few. And so he's selective when he chooses. Now, I just want you to remember something for a, a second. There are about 40 or 45 unique uh, miracles that Jesus does throughout all four Gospels. Okay, well, not ones that are repeated, but unique, identifiable, specific miracles. And again, it's debatable what a miracle is, right? Because like I said, sometimes Jesus would just read someone's mind or he would do things that were obviously supernatural, but because of categorization or whatever, they're not always considered a miracle. So you can debate 40, 45, 50 or whatever. By the way, this doesn't include his own resurrection and his appearances and things like that and him being able to walk through uh, locked doors and things. These are things that Jesus did before his crucifixion. 40 or 45. However, the gospels sometimes give us these lists where it doesn't tell us exactly what Jesus did. It just says, and Jesus did many more signs, you know, in this town. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, in, in, in Mark chapter 1, it says that Jesus, that the city brought all of their sick and all of their demon possessed to Him, and He cleansed them all and drove out many demons. So, Obviously, he did many miracles, but again, it's not the same as the singular stories. So, in the life of Christ, and by the way, Ellen White says that there were towns that Jesus went into, but by the time he left that town, there was not one sick or hurting person in that town. So, over the life of, of, of uh, over the ministry of Jesus' life, he probably did hundreds of, of specific miracles. There are times where if you're uh, chronologically going through the stories of Jesus, He's probably doing about a miracle an hour in order for Him to do all the things that the, the story is alluding to. 
But the Bible doesn't give us all of those miracles. It's selective. And John himself is extremely selective of all the hundreds of wonderful works of power and signs of His divinity, John gives us seven. Just seven. So that should be somewhat instructive and meaningful to us. We're now going to look at one of those in John chapter 4. This is the second miracle recorded in John, although there were other things that took place that he refers to as a sign, but he identifies this as the second miracle. The first miracle was with his mother turning the water into wine. Okay, that was in Cana, as the verse says. So, follow along with me here, if you will. Most of the verses will be on the screen, but if you have your Bibles and you want to see it on your own, uh, in your own Bibles, that would be fine as well. This is the last section in John chapter 4. So, he's already met with the woman at the well. He's already talked about um, um, those who worship must worship in spirit and truth and done some wonderful teachings and things. But we come now to the end of chapter 4, and the Bible reads thus. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And there was a royal official there whose son was sick at Capernaum. Okay? So, just to get the context and the idea of what's happening here, Jesus has now been in southern Israel for quite a while. He has celebrated the Passover, and he has now come back up into Galilee, back to the place where that first miracle that he had done had been uh, had, had been uh, completed. And that knowledge of that miracle had spread far and wide. And this, it says a royal official. Now, this was the territory of Herod, Herod the Tetrarch. The only royal official that had jurisdiction at this place is Herod. So, this royal official is somehow associated with Herod. He's a Jew, okay? He's definitely a Jew, But he is someone of influence, someone that associates with the palace of Herod, and he has that that identifier. This is not a peasant. uh, This is not a Pharisee or Sadducee. This is a royal official coming from the palace or connected with the palace of Herod. And it says that his son was sick at Capernaum. Just so you know, so you get your, your bearings here, about 16 miles between Cana and Capernaum, or a good day's walk. Okay, about a day's walk. They would walk 15, 20 miles on a casual. You could go faster if you had a mule or you had a, 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 you know, a camel or something like that. But when people walked and the road wasn't always straight and, and, and easy, it was a good day's walk. Okay? So he hears that Jesus, the miracle worker, has come back to Canaan. And this person has a, a son who has been sick. But I want you to keep in mind, up until this point, John has not mentioned that Jesus has healed a soul. He's turned water to wine. And that was amazing, and people were talking about it, but he'd not raised the dead. He'd not driven out any demons, according to John yet. He'd not uh, uh, healed anyone who had been sick or cleansed leprosy. And yet this royal official has a confidence that if Jesus is the Messiah and the miracle of turning the water to wine is a sign of Him being the Messiah, then the Old Testament had told us that the Messiah would have the power to do these types of works. So, in a way, he is the first to come to Jesus to ask for physical healing. Does that make sense? Um, And so, he comes to Jesus, this royal official, man of influence and authority. And by the way, I I wanted to point out the reason I hesitated. I remember there was one more thing. Among the Gospels, this story is not unique because there were several other times that people of high status would come to Jesus and ask for similar blessings. And I wanted to point those two out as well. Jairus, in Matthew chapter 9, a synagogue official by the name of Jairus came to Jesus and asked Him to heal his daughter. Do you remember that story? And in the process of Jesus coming, the daughter died. You remember this story? And that's also the story where the woman reached out and touched the hem of His garment as Jesus was going to heal the little girl. Okay? So, in that story, an official a synagogue official, asks Jesus to come to to his home, and Jesus agrees to come. Another story that is similar and is going to impact on this story is that a Roman centurion in Matthew chapter 8 also came to Jesus and asked that Jesus would heal his servant. And in that story, Jesus said, yes, I'll come and heal your servant. And the centurion said, no, 
Uh, I'm not worthy to have you come in my house, but I realize that you are a man of authority. I'm a man of authority too. I say to my soldiers, do this, and they do it. You are a man of authority. If you but speak the word, you can heal my servant. So in, this, in the story of the Roman centurion, Jesus speaks the word, and the servant is healed. With Jairus' daughter, he comes into the home. Okay, so you have a royal official, a Jewish official, and a Roman official. These three stories are all kind of similar that come to Jesus and ask that someone that they love would be healed. Just keep that in mind. Remember, John chooses this story out of the hundreds of stories that John could have chosen. He chose this one story to teach us something that the other Gospels did not have. He wants us to see something here that the other stories do not have. And led by the Holy Spirit, this is the only gospel that even has this story. So it stands to reason that there is something here that we need to see, that John wants us to see about the role of Jesus Christ. So this royal official comes, says, heal my son. I'd really like that. You've made the water into wine. If you're really the Messiah, I'm, I'm willing to humble myself and come from Herod's palace. Okay, I know I'm still just in the first verse, but there's a couple other things i got to mention. <laughs> He is a royal official of who? Herod. Is Herod a good guy or a bad guy? Okay, this is not Herod the Great who slaughtered the innocents, but it is his son, Herod the Tetrarch. Now, what was Herod the Tetrarch probably at this very moment doing to John the Baptist? Arresting him. In chapter 3, we just did this last week, the last testimony of John John, uh, uh, of John the Baptist, John the Apostle says that this was John's last testimony before his arrest. So John mentions this is the last thing that John had did, and then he got arrested. He gets arrested by Herod. And in the very next chapter, a royal official coming from Herod approaches Christ. So at the very moment that John is probably imprisoned, and again, in the foreknowledge of Christ, the ultimate result of John's imprisonment is he's going to be beheaded by Herod. And here this guy comes from Herod. Okay, keep all that in mind. The other officials that came to Christ, the connection of this individual with Herod, all right? Verse 47 when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, I don't have time to go into it. Um, if, if your son was about to die and you knew the Messiah was a couple days away, would you wait for the Messiah to come? Or would you go to the Messiah no matter where he was? There's something unique about this in that he waited for Christ to leave the jurisdiction of Pilate. He waited for the Messiah to leave Judea and come closer into Galilee. This is part of the pagan and, and, and backward ways of thinking that God only operated uh, within a, a territorial boundary. Um, and, and I don't want to get into it yet because it's kind of bizarre, but I think that's what's implying. He waits for Jesus to come closer. He's now 16 miles away from Capernaum. He says, that's close enough. I'm going to go to the Messiah. I'm going to come from Herod's palace and from the authority of Herod and I'm going to approach the Messiah. He came down to him, imploring him to heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, I wanted you to keep those other stories about the Jewish official Jairus and the Roman centurion who also came to Jesus. In those stories, which we're very familiar with and we're very thankful for the moment that we see Jesus responding, Jesus responded very different in those stories. When Jairus comes to Jesus and says, will you come? My, my daughter is sick. She's at the point of death. Jesus says, okay, sure, let's go. I'm ready. And then the woman reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. Oh, who touched me? I felt the power. Oh, by faith you've been healed. Oh, don't bother the master anymore. Uh, your daughter has died. No, no, don't worry about it. She's only sleeping. Talitha kum, little lamb, I say to you, arise. It's a beautiful story. The story of the Roman centurion, the same. This Roman official, pagan, comes to Jesus and said, would you heal my servant? Uh, 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 just speak the word. And Jesus says, okay, I love it. Uh, your faith is, by the way, this, I, that, that's a great story. He impresses Jesus. Jesus says, I have not found this faith anywhere in Israel. Wouldn't you like to have the faith that makes Jesus go, wow. 
and it came from a Roman pagan centurion. And Jesus went, man, what faith. I want to have that kind of faith too. In those stories, Jesus says, sure, yes, I hear the need and I'm going to respond. Not in this story. Notice what Jesus says. And at first glance, it might appear a little harsh. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. He kind of rebuked. Isn't that a little bit of a rebuke? Uh, can you read it a different way? I mean, there's compassion, I understand. But G this, here you have a father traveling 16 miles, coming probably at some stake of his reputation. He was probably, uh, uh, you know, willing to humble himself to some degree. You're the Messiah. You turn the water to wine. You, you seem to be uh, uh, the, the, the one that Moses and the prophets have told us about. And I have a son who's about to die. Would you have, to have expected Jesus to say this? It's a little bit of a rebuke. You're demanding a sign of me, and you, unless you see this sign, you won't believe? Now, I want you to know that John has been, been starting a narrative. This fits within a context. This isn't an isolated event all on its own. And I want to take you to the context of this sentiment in John so you understand where Jesus is coming from, at least to a degree. All right. Back in John chapter 2, after the turning of the water to wine, Jesus goes to Jerusalem and He celebrates the Passover. And he, it's, it's the first temple cleansing. There's two times that Jesus would go into the temple and drive people out and rebuke them for abusing the temple. John chapter 2 mentions the first time. He goes in the temple, He overturns the tables, He says, get these hints and, and, and all that. He cleanses the temple here in John chapter 2. And right after that experience... The Bible says this, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs which he was doing. Okay, now again, at first glance, you say that's good. Isn't that what Jesus wants? He wants people to trust in his name. He wants people to accept him as the Messiah. But notice what John says, they believed in him because they saw his signs, the signs of cleansing the temple, the signs of turning the water into wine. Again, he'd not done any other miracles up to this point, so those are the only signs he can be referring to. But notice verse 24, but Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them because he knew all men. You, do you understand what it's saying? And notice this, I want to point out, this word entrusting, it's the same Hebrew word as believing. In, in, in he, or excuse me, Hebrew, did I say Hebrew, John? You got you to help me out here, bro, that's what you're there for. In Greek, in Greek, the same word for faith, trust, and belief is the same word, pisteo, okay? So depending on its context and construction, we sometimes translate it as faith, belief, trust, but it's the same basic word, same root of the word. So it says that many were believing in Jesus' name, but He wasn't believing in them. They were trusting in His name, but He wasn't trusting in them. Because He knew what was in man. In other words, He knew that their trust and their belief was superficial. It was not, it was not relational. It was selfish. It was one-sided. They believed in Him because they felt they were getting something from Him, but they themselves were not willing to give to Him. Have any of you ever had a friend, a family member, that seems to always take but never give? Anyone want to testify? No, we don't want to do that. I will give a story, though. I had a good friend in high school. Good friend, one of my best friends. He never had a dime to his name. We would go to the movies, we would go to uh, Taco Bell, uh, we'd go bowling, and we'd all kind of pool our money together. Hey, how much is it for us to go to the water park or whatever? Oh, it's three bucks a piece or whatever, the monster truck rally, and we'd all, Casey never had a dime. Sorry, guys, I don't have anything. And by the way, Casey was fine. He had a fine life. He wasn't in poverty, okay? But he was like, oh, I'm a few bucks short, guys. And it became kind of a joke around us, you know, oh, Casey never has a dime. Casey never has a dime. Um, we were actually at a, a, do you remember there used to be a store called Blockbuster? 
Any of you, have you heard of Blockbuster? We were at this ancient place called Blockbuster, and he did the same thing Casey always does. He, he okay, we're getting, and back then a movie was two bucks or whatever to rent, and oh, sorry guys, I didn't want no allowance this week, and there's about four or five of us, and one of my bigger uh, friends, his name was Jeff, he came around Casey, and he grabbed him, and pinned his arms like this, and he's like, what are you doing, what are you doing? And then we went around, we went into his pockets, and we pulled out handfuls of cash. And you want to know what Casey said? It's not mine, I'm holding it for a friend. By the way, Casey, if you're watching, still love you, buddy, but you know what's true. And again, we loved him. He, was, he gave in other ways, right? He gave in friendship. He gave in, in uh, you know, giving us rides in his car. You know, so it, was, it wasn't totally imbalanced, but it just kind of, he was always taking when it came to money, and he never had anything, and it was one-sided. And, you know, in a more serious tone, when a relationship is like that, it's not a happy situation. If one side is always taking and the other is, and Jesus recognizes that if your relationship with Him is only based on what can you do for me, what prayer are you going to answer today, what, what magic trick are you going to do for my entertainment today, or what enemy of mine are you going to punish today, and if that is the only basis of your belief and faith and trust in Him, it's imbalanced and it is not what God desires for your life. Who do you think he is? You know, there's lots of analogies of, of, of negative ways in which we sometimes view God. But there are two mechanistic ways that I, I like to remind people of. Um, one is the vending machine model of God, okay? You've all used a vending machine, okay? Again, I know they're kind of becoming passive. But you know those machines that have the snicker bars and the chips, and you put the money in, and you push the buttons, and the little thing spins out, and you get the goodie, Right? I can't believe I actually had to define that because there might be some people here who don't know what a, def- what a vending machine is, okay? A vending machine, but some people treat their relationship with God like God is a vending machine. They look at the menu of goodies and they say, oh, look, there's something that God has promised. There's something that God wants me to have in this vending machine. So I'm going to put in my prayers. I'm going to put in my church attendance. I'm going to put in my tithe. I'm going to put in my good works. I'm going to push the button and then the goodies are going to come to me. And by God's grace, He does give us a lot of goodies. But do you know that vending machines aren't perfect? Do you know that sometimes the little, the little spiral thing spins and the Snickers bar is coming, it's coming, but then all of a sudden it, it twists and it, and it bumps and it hangs there and it doesn't drop? You've been there? Yeah. Now, when that happens, when that happens and the Snicker bar doesn't come, I'd be willing to bet that most of you, you do this, you say, Obviously, the Lord didn't want me to have a Snickers today, and I'm thankful that the Lord has blessed me enough to to separate me from that temptation of a Snicker bar. He has made that Snicker hang up in the machine so they can bless someone else. They're going to get two Snickers when they put the button because mine's going to fall, and the Lord must want that. Is that what most people do when the vending machine doesn't work? What do you do? You bang on the glass you shake it back and forth, you kick it, you call the manager, you swear, you curse, you do anything you can because you deserve that snicker bar and it didn't come. Now, I know I'm being a little bit embellishing and facetious, but I'm telling you, a lot of people treat God just like that. They think He's a machine. God, you promised me these blessings. I put in all my Sabbath keeping. I haven't sworn in a week. I didn't watch the bad things on television. I did all the good things. I pushed the button and the blessing is stuck. So I'm going to kick you. I'm going to yell at you. I'm going to shake the machine until I get the blessing. Friends, Jesus does not want to have that type of relationship with you. That is not the way God works. And some of the people that were believing in Him were treating Him like a vending machine. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into more. But the other one is a slot machine. You you don't know what a slot machine is. You're very wonderful people. You don't gamble. A slot machine is one of those gambling devices. Okay, you put in money, you pull the trigger, and you hope for a good result. I'll let you think on your own. This is a little homework for you. Do you sometimes treat God like a gambling machine too? I'll let you do that. But this is the point. This is the point of this story. Jesus recognizes 
that there needs to be something deeper in the relationship. There needs to be something more than just a, what can you do for me? Even though this is much more dramatic than the, the, the blessings that I was talking about, this is about a man's son. But even in this, Jesus uses the opportunity to say, in the midst of this need and request, I want to do more than just heal your son. I want to make you my son. I want to heal your son, but I want you too. And I don't want this to be the basis of the relationship that only if I do the good things for you that you'll continue in this. So Jesus gives this context. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. He almost, he doesn't argue with the Lord. He doesn't contradict him. All he knows is that even though his faith is imperfect, his faith is imperfect, he still is seeking the blessing of God. Come down before my child dies. Jesus recognized, you know, the Bible says, ask and you'll receive. Even though he did not have all the right conceptions, even though he was mistaken in some of his ideas of who the Messiah is, the goodness of God prevails. So Jesus said to him, notice what he says. He doesn't say, I'm going to go with you those 16 miles. I'm telling you, you go those 16 miles. And believe when I tell you, your son lives. Go, your son lives. And it says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke. Remember, John's gospel begins, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The man believed the word of Jesus, and he obeyed. He believed, and he obeyed. He started off. Now, I just, sometimes you got to get into these stories. He's 16 miles from his son. He left his son not knowing if he'd ever see his son alive again. This was the desperate act of a father. He comes to the Messiah, makes this bold request, imperfect faith, wrong ideas of the Messiah, but still faith, at least of a mustard seed, that God responds to it. God gives him the promise, go, your son lives. He says, I believe your word, and then he begins a 16-mile journey back to his child. And what do you think he was thinking every step of the way? I believe. My son's going to live. And the next hour, the Lord has spoken. My son lives. He had not seen it. He had no evidence of it. He had no proof of it. But every step of that 16-mile journey, he was clinging and claiming to the promise of the Messiah, your son lives. With no evidence or proof, every step of that 16-mile, hey, how long does it take to walk 16 miles? Six, seven, eight hours, even if he's in a hurry? Your son lives. And he's claiming it. He's believing it. He's trusting it. Now, the next part. As he was obeying, as he's going down, notice what the Bible says. His slaves met him, saying that his son was living. So there's, there's several angles here I want to point out to you here. First, it was a mercy It was a mercy that God arranged that as he's going, maybe he met them at mile four, maybe mile eight, maybe mile 11, I don't know. But at some point, by the mercies of God, it had been arranged that from the moment God had spoken that Jesus had said, your son lived, there at the house in Capernaum, they noticed that the fever broke, they noticed that the son had revived, they noticed that he'd been healed, and they said, we don't want to make dad wait any longer. Hey, you guys, get on the trail to Cana, find dad, tell him his son lives. 
So in the mercy of God, as he is making that 16-mile trip, he sees his slaves come to him, and they give him the good news, your son lives. And that's fine, that's wonderful, but I want you to notice something else. He owns slaves. Is it, is it too obvious to say that? You know, we live in a day in a culture where there is this idea that if you don't have perfect compliance with people's idea of morality, then they cannot associate with you or have you in their social circle. You know, Jesus could very easily have said, look, Mr. Official, I'd like to help you. I tell you what, you free all your slaves and you quit working for Herod because he's going to behead my cousin and his daddy murdered babies in Bethlehem. Okay, you leave all that negativity behind. You get rid of all those evils in your life, and then we're going to talk about what God wants to do in your life. Can we do that? Let's have a little bartering here. Do you realize that Christ was completely able of saying that? He didn't, though. This man had an imperfect faith, and he had an imperfect life. He had an imperfect worldview. He did not have all of his ducks in a row. But God did not require him to have everything in his life perfect before he would bless him. You know, we're the body of Christ when we come to church. I, I'm not the Lord. I know you think some of you. No, I'm not. <laughs> but we, we, we are. And when people come into our community, they should not be told, oh, you're welcome, but did you drink last week? You're still struggling with alcohol? Well, you get that sorted out first, and then we'll talk about it. And how do you feel about, oh, you got divorced? Well, we don't believe that that's appropriate. So once you get that sorted, then we can talk about what God wants to do in your life. Oh, you have different ideas about LGBTQ people? Well, we view that differently, so you better get your worldview squared away, and then we'll talk about what God wants to do in your life. That is not the body of Christ. This story shows us that Jesus looked at a highly imperfect individual working for a tyrant, enslaving his fellow man, wrong ideas of faith, but none of that mattered because an innocent child was being interceded for. Jesus wants to heal all these issues, but he was willing to set those aside to heal one individual. And his slaves brought him the good news. I find that to be ironic. He inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. They said to him, yesterday, the seventh hour. So it's already been a day. Notice that. It's already been a day that he'd been walking on that journey. It was yesterday, the seventh hour, that the fever left him. The father knew it was at that hour when Jesus said to him, your son lives. And hallelujah, he himself believed. He continued in his, in his belief because it said earlier that he believed, so his belief was confirmed. And then his whole household, in the household, in the palace, in the royal officials of Herod, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. This again, John tells us, is the second sign that Jesus performed when he came out of Judah, Judea into Galilee. So just in closing, a couple of reminders and thoughts about I think some of the things that John wants us to understand from this very limited look into the life of Christ. One, it is never wrong to come to Jesus, friends. It is never wrong. And I hear this a lot in the church. People say, well, I, I, I'd come to church or I would, I would pray more or I'd get my life right. I, I would do these things, but I got to get these other things in my life right first. And then I will come to the Lord. Then I'll come to church. Then I'll start you know, trying to get back into the faith. It is never wrong to come to Christ. You want to know to what extreme I believe that? Even those that were trying to destroy Jesus were still blessed when they were in His presence. Think about the Roman that nailed Jesus to the cross in the presence of Christ when Jesus cried out, Father, do not forgive them. Or excuse me, Father, do not. That was a wrong thing. John, where were you on that one, man? Here we go. 
forgive them for they don't know what they do, and then he dies, that Roman who nailed them said, surely this must be the Son of God. Even those that sought to destroy him, if open and given the opportunity, they were blessed by having a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is never wrong. How often is it wrong to come to Christ? This side got it. I like that. Guys, you're in trouble. Even if your motives... And by the way, your motives will never be 100% pure. We're still in the flesh. We're still being changed day by day into His likeness. Even if your motives aren't pure, you have imperfect faith, incorrect presumptions, come, come, come into the presence of Christ. You will always find goodness there. It is always right to obey His Word. Notice the man came asking for Jesus to come. Come, come heal my son. But he obeyed and listened when Jesus said, I can do it without coming. I can just speak the word. Which, by the way, I want to go back to those other stories. Where did that Roman centurion, who also was from Capernaum, get the idea when he came to Jesus, you don't have to come to my house. You can but speak the word and my servant can be healed. Where did that centurion get that? Do you think it's possible that this second miracle that John records, that that became known in the vicinity? And by the way, the the reason the Romans were there was to spy on the Jews. Obviously, he hears this story and he applies it to his own life. If you can heal that royal official's son by speaking the word, you can heal my servant in the same way. Jesus asked him to go and he obeyed. His request was granted as he was going. He obeyed despite having imperfect faith. It is always right. Sometimes it seems like the Lord asks you to do crazy things. And it's not what you asked and it's not what you expected. But when you know He's asked you to do something, it's always right to do it. But Lord, if I take this job and just work a little bit on the Sabbath, I'm going to have more money. I'm going to give it to the church. It's going to go to charity. But my word says rest. But Lord, if I... If I do this, things are going to be better. If I just do it my way, I've given you the way. It's always right to obey His Word. And finally, as I've been saying throughout this series, Jesus always is and does more. More. It wasn't just one life that hung in the balance. Jesus knew there were misconceptions about him. Jesus knew that people were missing the point of his power. And he uses this moment to do something deeper and more significant than just healing. He sends him home with the promise. The son is healed. The entire household accepts Jesus as the Messiah because of this. Others are inspired by this. And I I can't prove it to you, friends. I can't make a direct connection between the Roman centurion And this story, other than the fact that they were both from Capernaum, and the stories are so similar. But I believe that there had to have been some connection. So a Roman shows more faith than anyone in Israel, possibly because of this story. Someone in the household of Herod and in the companionship of Herod. And this story becomes enshrined in Scripture for our benefit through the ministry of the Apostle John. Jesus wants more than just a superficial relationship. He wants to do more than just heal our situations. He wants to heal us from sin. And He wants to have an eternal relationship with us. He wants us to live with the peace and assurance that He is more than just a, a giver of gifts. He's more than just a Santa Claus. He's the good Father. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Lord. And He's the Savior. Who do you think He is? He's more. And He'll always be more when we let Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is always a privilege to journey into these stories, and I always feel a sense of inadequacy because I know we only scratch the surface, and 
only have so much time, but Lord, I pray that you would continue to instruct us through all the scriptures, through all the gospels, all the beautiful truths that you have placed there by your divine will, that we'll be ever drawn upward, that we'll never be satisfied or be limited in our desire to be more like you and to learn more from you. Father, as we go about our ways, as we uh, go to camp meeting or we worship here uh, over the next few Sabbaths, Lord, I just pray that every opportunity we have to commune with you, that you would draw us closer to yourself and that you would reveal yourself to us in new and powerful ways and show us how you are so much more than we could ever dream. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, everyone. If I don't see you up at Yava Pines in the next few weeks, we'll see you at the end of the month. God bless.